Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this church, for each and every valuable soul that is here today. We know you love us and you care for us. We love one another as you loved us. We ask your spirit to be with us now as we read from your word. Bless us. Then we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what a week. With a storm and everything that hit us, I mean, I'm busy. And come Wednesday morning, oh, we're getting her set here. Come Wednesday morning, all of a sudden it hits me. I'm supposed to be platform elder. Wednesday morning. And I, I mean, we take over the duties, we different elders take over duties every month, and I'm going, we're responsible to get somebody to speak. We're responsible for everything. And I go, what am I going to do? I can't ask someone else, I can't find him. It's too late. Now, I've, I've given a few sermons in the last month. And I said, well, I guess, Lord, I messed it up. It's my responsibility. So you give the sermon, but then find somebody else. And Mark was, was good enough to become platform elder this week. We didn't, have, we didn't have somebody do children's story. Someone else filled in, thank you. Rachel, thank you so much for the prayer. And Matthew, for reading the scripture. And I remember when I, I said, Lord, what am I going to do and it came to what have you been studying? And I had just been reading what Matthew read. I said, okay. And as anybody knows, we're supposed to send in by Wednesday, or actually Tuesday, what the sermon's going to be about. So I said, okay, there, I will gird you. Okay, that's what I've been studying. Don't know what I'm going to be giving. Don't have a thought. That's what it is. I was impressed. And so the sermon's about girding you. And it ends up totally different, as most sermons do, than originally I started thinking about, because God leads us in whichever way he wants to lead us. In the chapter that Matthew read, chapter 45, Around 44, 45, 46, Isaiah is talking about Cyrus. You know who Cyrus is? This, he's talking about Cyrus, and, and it's interesting to me because how I came to know there was truly a God was when I discovered Cyrus. Now, that seems strange, that's a story in itself. But as I read this passage as an early on Christian, or maybe even before I was a Christian, because I did not really believe in God, I was just searching for wisdom. As I read this and said, here it is, 130 years before it takes place. 130 years, and God is saying through Isaiah, that there will be a man called Cyrus that will set his people free. I said, think about that. And I, and I began to ponder that, and I said, Stan, do you know who the president will be 100 years from now? Can you name him? It's impossible. And not only did Isaiah say who it was going to be, he said how he's going to accomplish it. The details, they were all there. And at that point, I came to the realization that there really was a God. And I said to myself, there really is a God. There is truly a God. And then my next question, what does he want? What does he want you to do? What, what is his demands on you? You were born for a purpose. You were born for a reason. What are his purpose? So, so I'm going to give you a little background. Now, I'm going to start with Isaiah. 
44, verse 28, and 45, verse 1. And this is Isaiah describe, describing Cyrus. Now, at this time, uh, Israel was not doing quite well. They were, uh, they were making their gods of gold and worshiping them. I always thought that was kind of stupid. Why would you make gods of gold and calves and worship them? That didn't make that much sense. I said, they weren't very bright back then. Well, as I pondered that, I said, well, we're not very bright either. We do the same thing. We, we, we take our gold and stuff and we have it molded into cars, into houses, into planes, into boats, into many different, and they become our gods. We worship them rather than the God that gave us the ability to get them. So we still do the same thing as the Israelites do. Anyhow. Isaiah 44, verse 28. It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he will perform my duties. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built and of the temple, your foundations will be laid. Thus saith the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by my right hand to subdue nations and before him, and to loose the loins of kings, and to open doors before him, so that gates will not be shut. Okay. Lots, a lot of said in there. Here he is, God is saying, I'm raising up Cyrus. He's a pagan king. It doesn't say he's a king here. We don't find out a king till later. It doesn't say even where he comes from. He said, Cyrus is my servant. At that time, the ruling power was Assyria. And, and Babylon was, a, was under, under Assyria. They were, they were kind of like a satellite nation. They were nothing. Assyria was the power. And the Medes and the Persians, eh, they were even less. He doesn't talk about the Medes and the Persians here. All Isaiah is talking about is Cyrus. He says he will open the doors. If you know how Babylon was ca captured, was the, the river Euphrates ran through it, so they, they didn't have to worry about it. They had these massive grates. The chariots could run up and down between, their, between the walls. Nobody could conquer them. Nobody, nobody, impossible. They, they had a big feast. You remember the feast and then the handwriting on the wall? They were sitting here right. They had all the confidence in the world. Nobody's going to do it. <sighs> Wait a minute, but God's in charge. It's going to happen. He says it's going to happen. And now to the verse that I was reading when I decided I had to give a sermon. I am the Lord. Isaiah 45, 5. I am the Lord. There is no other. There is no God beside me. I will gird you, though you have not known me. And he's talking about Cyrus. He says, I'm going to gird you, Cyrus. What does it mean to gird? Now, that's not a common English term we use a lot. You don't hear it used much every day. I will gird you. Well, come on. It's, it's not something we hear. So I, I, like I normally have to, I take out my strong concordance, find out what is this word. This word for some reason jumped out at me. I would never had before. I will gird you. Gird the Hebrew is azar. Doesn't mean anything to azar. But behind that it says words that we, we can understand. It means to bind to equip, to clothe, to hold, to clasp, to close. I get an idea of what it means. Well, to get a better picture of what it means, I always find out where else has that word been used in the Bible. And I begin to get a better picture. It's a word picture. I like, the Bible is full of word pictures. Words draw pictures. And here it is. The psalmist, 1832, said, it is God that girds me with what? Strength. Strength is what he girds him with. So if I say, 
Cyrus is going to be, he's going to gird Cyrus. What's he girding him with? Strength. I am going to strengthen you, Cyrus. That's what he's saying. I'm going to strengthen you. Nobody knows who Cyrus is, but he's, I'm going to strengthen you. You haven't even been born yet. I'm going to make you perfect. Or you're going to fulfill my will. There's another way of putting it. For Samuel 2, 4, speak, and, and, and in this context, uh, for Samuel, he's, he's going positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. Get this. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumble will be girded with strength. That's what, so you're fighting a battle, and you stumble, but I'm going to gird, I'm going to strengthen you so you can, so you can stand and fight. I'm going to gird you. I'm going to strengthen you. So that word means to strengthen. And I said, whoa, wow. What, what? Strengthen you. Uh, there's a force outside that's going to strengthen you. And I said, what, what, what do you mean? Well, I'm a, I thought about it. I prayed about it. And all of a sudden it comes to me. Years ago, I used to lift weights. Yeah. I used to lift weights. And when you lift weights, you put a belt around you to strengthen you. Does the belt strengthen you? No, it strengthens your core. Your core muscles are tightened up because you've got your spine in back. And your spine isn't that powerful. And what you're doing when you wrap that belt around you and tighten it up, it strengthens your core. It gives you a backbone. That's another way to put it. Now you've got a backbone. He's strengthened you. God outside has strengthened you. He has girded you. His strength is now helping you do what you have to do in his behalf. So, so that was the Hebrew word. And I said, okay, how has that ever been used in the Greek? So uh, that's, that's the problem. We got, we got Old and New Testament. We got one written in Hebrew and one written in Greek. So I had to look up the Greek. And I tried to pronounce these words, and excuse me, it, it came out prednisone. I said, prednisone? No, I know that's a drug. <laughs> but it, it's not prednisone, it's peridazone. And it means belt. Okay, well, okay, it's a belt. How was it used? In the New Testament, girding this belt, this belt that they're talking about. And I ran into Ephesians 6. And in Ephesians 6, Paul is talking about the armor of God. He's talking about the armor. He's in jail. He's in chains. And he's talking about the armor of God. And, let's, and I'm going to break it down because I haven't got the time to read the whole thing. But important parts I want to bring out. Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brothers, be strong. Huh? 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 There it is. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. His, he's, he's the one girding you. He is the one putting that belt around you. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against me, the wiles or the schemes of the devil. You have to be girded. You have to have his strength in order to stand against the devil. Two verses down, he gives more, a little more detail. He says, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Where is our strength? Where does the strength come from? From truth. Your truth gives you strength. He is the truth. If we have Jesus in our life, he girds us. He is the You get the picture? He is our strength because he is truth. So God, God's teaching me a lot of things that I'm studying this lesson. Getting ready to give this sermon. In fact, in fact, as I read it, I found it in Revelation. Two places in Revelation. The only place where it's found it twice is in Revelation. Revelation 1.13. 
And in the midst of the seven can't lampstands is one like the Son of God. And many of you know this already. Clothed, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. He has got the robe of righteousness on and the belt fastening it is truth. You get the picture. He is the truth. He is. If we have that robe of righteousness, we must be girded by the truth. We have strength then. If we know it is the truth. That gives you a certain sense of security. Say, I know it is true. I have strength. I have that deeper strength. And it comes, that truth comes from outside of me. Well, I thought more about this. I said, okay, gird, 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 gird. Ah, there's an English word that gird is used in. It's called, ladies, girdle. 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 What? And so I said, well, what's a girdle do? Is there, is there any similarities? And it says, girdle says, shape and support. Shape and and give strength. Shape and give strength. Same word. If he what girds Cyrus, he's what? Shaping Cyrus for what he wants. And he's giving him strength. He's girding him to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. And Cyrus is now going to accomplish it. Because he is the servant of God. God sets up who he will. He desires. He can take this foreign king and set him up to do what he wants him to do because he is God. He's in charge. He is the sovereign. He is the God of gods. He is the God of kings. He's the king of kings. He is my sovereign. So God rises up and he puts down who he will. And that's what it says in the word. I want, in the Psalms, I've, I've got some verses here. In the Psalms, I look at the time to make sure I don't go over. Psalm 75, 5 through 7. There's a warning given here. It says, do not lift your horn on high. Do not speak with a stiff neck. Oh, boy, that, that really makes a lot of sense to you, doesn't it? It's a metaphor. If you are in an agricultural community back then, you would bring this beast in and to put a yoke on it, and it would fight you. It wouldn't do what it's supposed to do. You are the master of it, and you won't. It's like God is in charge. Are you going to do what He wants? You're going to do what you want. And they said, "Do not lift your horn." And if you know, they got their horns, and they're sitting, and they put this yoke on, and He's fighting. He's throwing his heads around. He's lifting his horns. He's fighting against the yoke. He's stiff-necked. He's not going to do it. He's got pride. He's got insolence. He's not going to do it. He says, don't be this way. For exaltation, it says, comes from, does not neither come from the east nor from the west nor from the south. But, ah, uh, three-letter words, but, but says, God is the judge. It's not for us to judge. God is a judge. He puts down one, he exalts another. And I thought immediately about Saul and David. Saul was empowered by God. But he fought against what God wanted. And God, what did God do? Put him down and put David in his place. He did that. Daniel knew it quite well. I'm not going to read all these, just bits and pieces. Daniel says he removes kings and he sets up kings. He removes and sets up. He is in charge. He is the sovereign. He says who will be king and who will not be king. What happens next month? 
take a little break. What happens next month? We have elections, don't we? We have elections. We determine who's going to be president of the United States, right? We determine. <laughs> That's funny. God determines who is going to be president. Does that mean we shouldn't vote? No, because he still works if, the, if he can through his people. He knows what's best. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to happen. So you know, he'll, he'll override our, our stupidity or whatever you want to call it. And I remember four years ago, I, I had nothing to do with politics. And I, those who know the story, I said after Vietnam, I, I had nothing to do with poli anything political. However, in the last election, there was a man running that I said, wow, this guy should be president. And I believe it firmly in my heart. And so I attended a caucus. Never had attended a caucus before in my life. It was a Republican caucus. So if you've got Democrats, don't, don't worry about it. But I didn't care. I was interested in the man. I said, this is God's man. And he is God's man. God used it for many purposes. And I remember getting there, and they said, who are you going to vote for? Who do you want? And I said, Ben Carson. <laughs> ben Carson. I want Ben Carson. They said, oh, we got nobody speaking for Ben Carson. Do you want to speak for him? I have never been involved in a caucus in my life. And I'm going, yeah, I believe he should be the man. I believe they had a lot of candidates running. And I had one, two, if it wasn't Ben Carson, maybe eh, this guy would be all right, or, or that person would be all right. And so I got up and I spoke for Ben Carson. But he didn't come out. Okay. Was I wrong? I thought, oh, he's a good, but God had not picked him for that particular, he picked this other joker. I'm sorry. That's what I felt. I, he was the Lord. I said, if I had, of all the candidates, anybody I wanted back was not this guy. I mean, this is the time of year that everybody gives promises that they're going to do, and then they never fulfill them. And I knew Ben Carson, if he said he was going to do it, it would be done. But God knows better than me. It's not what we know sometimes, but how we respond to what God has given us, that's important. He, there's not a perfect king, there's not a perfect president. God uses imperfect people to carry out his perfect will. God uses imperfect people to carry out his perfect will. What does God want from us? And this is the rest of the sermon. What does God expect from us? If we have a president that we don't like, we think this is the worst president, what are we to do? Okay. Let's see what the Bible has to say and read and we begin to understand. Now God raises up, he raised up Pharaoh and says, let me, let me read, for this very purpose, he raised up Pharaoh and says, for this very purpose I have raised you up, Pharaoh, foreign God, foreign president, foreign emperor, whatever you want to call him, that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed to all the world. I'm going to show, you're powerful, you're the most, you, you are nothing. The world's going to know that I am, I am king, I am in charge. And so he uses what, imperfect people to show his perfectness. And that's what he used Pharaoh for. He raises people up for different reasons. We don't know. He knows the end from the beginning. We don't know. We think we know certain things, but we don't. And the longer I live, the more I find out that's true. Just when I start thinking I'm getting smart, it's about time to die. So let's begin our little study.
well, we've still got 15 minutes left. Start with Romans. You can turn to Romans 13, and I'll start with verse 1. What are we to do? Here's Paul, Paul writing in Romans. He says, Paul, who was later thrown in jail, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except what God has. There is no, there is no authority except that God has established. So if I say, man, that president is terrible. Wait a second. God has put him there. How should I respond? How should I as a human being respond? If I hate, I don't care if it's Obama or Trump or, or Biden or whatever. How should my response be as a Christian, as one who follows Christ? Well, we got, we got the word. God has put him in authority. Let's keep reading. And authorities exist and have been established by God. He says again, he has been, whoever I put it, has been established by God. You may not like him, but he's there because I put him there. Consequently, verse 2, whoever rebels against the authority, doesn't like that authority, is rebelling against what God has initiated. You're rebelling against God. If, if, I, if I don't like Trump or I don't like Obama or Biden or, and, 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 they, and they are the president, who am I rebelling against? Obama, Trump, Biden, whatever. No, I'm rebelling against God because God says, I put him there. You might not know why I put him there, but I put him there. And those who do so, huh, he adds, will bring judgment on themselves. So you start talking down the president who God has appointed. What? You're bringing judgment on yourself. Yeah, that's the only part of the story. Let's continue. Verse 4. It says, for one in authority is God's servant for your good. Now, I'm going to read, we must pray for our leaders, yes. How do we pray for somebody who we just, we think this, we realize God put him there and God wants him strengthened. He wants him to do that purpose for which he put him there, whatever it is. I don't know. I think I know. But I'm not God. How do you, how do you change that person? If, if, if you need, you have the ability to change them. What do you real? What do you do? Remember the verse says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There are certain things, there are certain laws that we have, certain rights that we have to do. Certain rights we have, we shouldn't do. Even in Exodus, it says, you shall not revile a God, nor curse the rulers of your people. Wow. I mean, I've seen people turn on Trump, and I've seen people turn on, on Biden, who well, isn't president yet, but on... Um, Every president I've ever had, there's been people that have been upset and turned on him. In 1 Timothy, again, again, Paul is writing to Timothy. Again, 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Therefore, I beg of you, I, I exhort you, he says, with all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks that be made for all men, for the kings and for all who are in authority. We should be praying making intercession for these that we might lead a quiet and peaceful life. We're to be praying for them. First Peter, first Peter. So we had Paul's idea, now we get Peter's idea. What's Peter doing? Here's what Peter says, first Peter 2. Therefore, submit yourself to every authority or institution of the man, of man, for the Lord's, for the whose sake? For the Lord's sake. He has appointed them for his sake. 
He has appointed these leaders. And I might ask, not only presidents, but leaders within the church. Any leader, whoever. Whether it be a king, president, or other governor, whatever. Verse 15, for this is the will of God that by doing good we may put to silence agents of fools. Obey them. Do good what's, what is required. Do what is required. And then he ends with verse 17. Peter says, honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God, honor the king. Fear God, honor the king. Actually, those two are, to me, as I look, it says fear God by honoring the king. Because he put him in place. It's a way we fear God, by honoring the king, whoever it is. Honor the king. Well, how do you honor the king if you don't believe in exactly the things that they want? Well, here's Peter telling us this, and guess what? Peter is telling us to honor Nero, the murdering Nero, who put him, by the way, to death. How are we to react as Christians? We're to honor the authority because God put them into place, even if we are put to death by them. We run into this conundrum. Jesus had the same conundrum. He said, when he prayed, and great blood, drops of blood, sweat, nevertheless, not my will, what I want, but yours be done, Father. And that should be our prayer. Father, I don't understand why we have this president, and this happens, this happens. but nevertheless, Whatever you want, you're using for, let your will be done. God not only appoints leaders, he controls their behavior. How can you do that? Huh. Proverbs 21.1, how, how does God control? He says, there it is. The king's heart, it said, the president's heart is like a stream of water in the hands of the Lord. And he turns it wherever he wills. He has control. He has control of Obama. He has control of Trump. I don't care if you're a Democrat. I don't care if we as Christians must obey those appointed. And if we don't, God blesses us with a leader, he will turn that blessing into a curse. If you don't follow the leader. Okay. Since the president is a representative of the whole nation, whoever curses the president also curses the nation and therefore curses himself if he lives in that nation. So instead of a blessing, what happens? We get a curse. Any president deserves respect, reserves, deserves honor. Any president deserves honor. I, I know there are those who are, you know, will do everything they can to upset the president or any, any person in authority. What do we need to do as Christians? And I heard somebody already say it. We need to pray more and complain less. Did you hear me? We need to pray more and complain less. Because God is still in charge. He controls things. He is in control. Do we believe that? Then we need to pray and say, we don't understand, Lord, what's going on. I've prayed that many times. I don't understand what's going on. But you're in charge. Whatever your will is. Let's do it. For things to get better, 
for things to get better. Pay attention. Sometimes we must get better. For things to get better, sometimes we must get better. See, prayer, prayer does not change God. What does it do? Most of you know, it changes us. It makes us understand. If we're praying for a leader, something he's done, we begin to understand more and more and more what that leader's going through. And it begins to change us. We begin to understand some things. Sometimes we're so worried of what's happening to us that we forget that what's happening in us. It's more important what's happening in us than what's happening to us. But there are those leaders who don't obey God. What must we do? Peter, we must obey God rather than man. And I, what's he say? Go out in the streets and riot then if, if he does. No, 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 no. God, if, if there's any rioting, that's not Christian. We know that. We know that. For God is love. And I, and, and I think back as I grew up, my, my, and I, some of you know my great hero was Martin Luther King. He, what, a, what a hero. At the time in the 60s, and, and I, was, I, was, I was young, I, was, I had, well, I had just come back from Vietnam. I was young, but as I looked, there were those who wanted to riot in the streets. Civil rights. And it was a, it was a good cause. And what drew me to the cause was this man, this man of God, an imperfect man, yes, but carrying out God's will, marched peacefully with dogs ripping at flesh and tearing people. And I seen that, and I, I was appalled and said, how dare they do this? And, and I was changed. Now, if there had been riots in the street, it wouldn't, that's my thing, they need to be arrested, they need to, Peacefully demonstrate if, if it is wrong. And it wasn't the president. It had been generations. This went through several presidents. This crime, as I would call it. They had the right, but it wasn't being fulfilled. Their rights weren't being ignored. What must we do? Second Chronicles 7, 14. And I know you know this one. If my people who are called by my name will what? Humble themselves. I don't know everything. And pray and seek my face. And turn from their wicked ways. And wicked ways, and not praying for the president is a wicked way, by the way. By the way. And I will hear from heaven and forgive us for our sins and heal the land. God appoints and rises up people. Jesus, remember when Jesus was, was before Pilate? Pilate says, don't you know that I have the authority to do this? And what did, what did Jesus say? You've got no authority except my father gave it to you. God is in charge. He is supreme. Should I vote? If my, if my vote doesn't mean anything, if God is going to decide who's going to do yes, I should. Because sometimes God works through us to accomplish his will. But are all kings appointed by God? Now, as I read some, I read, I can't get my paper separated here. Jose said, and Jose says, they set up kings without my consent. They choose princes without my approval. He allows them to do that. And say, see, I told you. If you do this. And so in a sense, he's allowing it to happen. Okay, have your will. I, oh, I remember the Israelites. Remember the Israelites were in the, in the desert? 
and, and God was feeding them with manna, and they, and they were real, man, we like to go back to eat. They, they had the best food. They had the, what did God do? Sent a bunch of quail, and they went out, and they gathered them up, and they got, and they got sick until they, they said they came out their nostrils. In other words, they were vomiting. They, they, it was too rich for them. They got what they wanted, and sometimes God gives us what we think we want. But we need to trust him to give us what we need. For he is the sovereign. So how do we, how do we get presidents to change your mind? Well, first off, we pray. For God has a way of what? Leading them, whichever he, like the water. He can deliver it. He can change. We pray. He is our God, after all. We ride in the streets. No. My mother used to have a saying, you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. Well, that was Martin Luther King. Peaceful, demonstrating, got his point across, and the country changed. Fear God and honor the king, or honor the emperor, or honor the president. First Peter 2, 17. We seek to honor the president because we fear God. God is the only one that we must seek to obey every time. And every time without question. And this wonderful God that we fear commands us to honor the president. Because he is under God's sovereign will. Thank you. Father, keep us near. Keep us leaning on your arm safe and secure because you have placed kings and presidents, rulers over us that love us and care for us and do their best as mortal men to accomplish your will. Continue to work. We know you love us and we know you care for us. And by faith, we will continue to lean on your arm. Thank you so much. Amen.